Thank you. I thought I'd start off being quite inspirational, so I picked two inspirational quotes that reflected the individuality. Maybe didn't pick them quite right, because the first one's by a Nazi. Um, it was by Oskar Schindler, um, who showed that even real gits can, be, can win sometimes. But he said, he who saves one life saves the world entire. And the second one is, was, was by Siddhartha Gautama, the guy who eventually became Buddha. Um, and his quote was, all men fear pain and death, all men love life. Remembering that he is one of them, let a man neither strike nor kill. That one man may conquer a thousand times a thousand men in battle. He who conquers himself is the greatest warrior. And I think the combination of these two quotes shows that we are in a, such a connected world where at the touch of our fingertips, we can connect to people the other side of the world instantly. But in many ways, we've lost our identity. We find this struggle so much more difficult than we did just a few years ago. And I think these two quotes encapsulate this quite nicely. Now, I'm a primatologist. I'm very, very lucky to have worked around the world with different species. I worked with orangutans in Sumatra, and I had a big affinity with the big red facial hair. Um, if I grow this out, it's like a ginger mess. I worked in the Caribbean with a group of monkeys, and I called my project Primates the Caribbean. <laughs> I'm that lame. But most of my work has been with chimpanzees. Um, I worked in Uganda and Congo for a few years um, for a renowned primatologist, Dr. Jane Goodall. Incredible opportunity. And one thing we saw with the chimps when I first got there, they all looked the same. It was so difficult. But then very quickly, you saw that there were individuals there. And part of my job was we had to follow them for weeks, if not months, eventually to try and get the wild group to accept us as one of their own. I was like that needy kid, that hanger on in any school playground. It's like, please be my friend. Um, and they finally accept you and let you follow them. One thing the chimps do uh, throughout the day, they do it the morning, they do it the evening, they do it at lunchtime, they do it when they're hungry, happy, horny, anything in between. They do a group affiliative call A pant hoot. I know with all you students there, you love a good definition, you know, you love to learn. So, we're going to learn. A pant hoot, best known to the chimpanzee vocalizations, blah, 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 blah. That doesn't really give you an idea of what a pant hoot is. So we're going to try something. Either this is going to work really, really well, or it's going to be the shortest TEDx talk you've ever heard. What happens is one individual starts, and it's not necessarily the eldest or the most mature or the most socially dominant. Any individual can start. And the rest of the group will join in when they as an individual feel it appropriate, but the rest of the group does join in. And just to let you know now, the initial chimp doesn't stop until the rest join in. I've got nowhere else to go today. And as you can see behind me, it starts quite gentle and it builds up pace. When you feel ready, you join in and it ends in a crashing crescendo. Thank you. <laughs> By far the world's worst chimpanzee group I have ever spoken to. We're doing it again at the end. Thanks, guys. I worked for Jane Goodall for a number of years and am now one of her trustees for JGI UK. Jane was and is an incredible individual. She went out to Tanganyika, which is now Tanzania, in 1960. She wasn't allowed to go on her own. It was too dangerous for a young girl to be out there on her own, so she took her mum. Um, Jane had only ever gone to secretarial school. She had no relevant qualifications for this, but she decided, that's it, I can do this. How hard can it be? She went out, and the work she did changed the way we not only look at animals, um, obviously chimps as well, but also how we look at ourselves. She did the same thing that I did a long time before I did, following a group of chimpanzees and gaining their trust to the point they would accept her. And it was one individual that changed the game. One animal called David Greybeard, very old male with a grey beard, and she followed the group and he allowed her to get closer to him to start with, and through him the rest of the group accepted her. And she started recording what she saw and what she was encountering with the chimpanzees. And she saw them eating meat. First time it had ever been seen. Sent the, the uh, letter back. 
didn't really hear much about it. No one really believed her. Then a few months or so later, she saw David, David Greybeard, with a tiny piece of leaf, a uh, stalk. He'd fashioned the end, he'd nipped it with his teeth, made sure it was just right, gone to a termite mound, fished in, brought it out, ate the termites. Wrote to her supervisor, a uh, renowned uh, anthropologist, Lewis Leakey, who replied saying, orcs, not quite, um, basically replied very famously saying, Jane, now we need to redefine tool, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees as humans. This really rocked the world by having this encounter with this individual. When Jane got back to the UK, she started her PhD. Uh, so went from secretarial school to PhD. It's a bit of a jump um, in terms of career advice. She was told at the time, oh, you poor girl, silly. Of course you've got it wrong. You've, you've seen them as individuals. You should have given them numbers, not names. That's how we do things. I should go, right, well, that's not how it works. I mean, these, these animals did these things. David Greybeard does this, and, and so and so and so. And so all these different animals, these different beings, are acting in different ways. And she was ridiculed and not believed and wasn't accepted for a long time. And look at us now. We finally accept that animals have unique um, behavioral traits, characteristics, personalities. And that was something that Jane really, really pioneered. Jane's won the right, obviously. Um, this is Uehara next to her. Even here, you can see who this is. So I've forgotten Uehara's name this morning. And I was busily WhatsApping some colleagues. I said, oh, I've forgotten the name. Who, who is this with, with Jane? And instantly, everybody in the group knew who it was because of the facial features. They're, they're that different. This was Passa, one of my best friends. And she was. Passa, um, out in Uganda. I trained on a chimpanzee sanctuary island. So basically my job for six months was to play with baby chimps to learn how they interact. Best job ever. Again, it was working through with Passa that I learned about the individual and learned just how much you can learn about a species or a group by interacting with one. Um, I was told that chimpanzees are terribly dangerous. They're eight, nine, ten times stronger than us. Um, Never, ever go near them in a cage. So like a moron, I put my hand in a cage one day because she wanted to touch a little scar that I got on my hand. And we groomed for about two hours. It was incredible. Um, stupidly, I could have lost my arm, but I didn't. Um, and it was through working with, with animals and people like Passa and, and different individuals that allowed me and allows Jane and allowed other people to really understand the natural world. There's a few other characters as well. There's Sunday, who lives on the island still, who used to be a circus chimp, who beckons fishermen to the shores, and when they come close, he jumps in their boat, pulls the engine cord, and put putts across Lake Victoria. Twice that's happened. Says a lot for the local fishermen. But, oh, but, with an individual, there's only so much you can do. Each of us is an island. Sounds cliche, but it's true. Working with the natural world and working with a range of species, you see that it's only through cooperation we can really achieve massive things. Now, one thing you never see really in these Attenborough programs is that sometimes there are just very sneaky animals. So I'm working with some bees at the moment for a project I'm work, uh, filming with. And the researcher last week said, some of our bees are just quite lazy. I said, what do you mean lazy? Said, well, some of them sort of pretend they're going to fly at the nest, uh, do a bit of a loop, and come back to the nest again. I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are also stories about penguins who all huddle up in the, uh, down in the Antarctic uh, for their life, and they all take it in turns to stand on the edge, oh, I'll freeze my butt off for a while, and then I'll back in. And um, There's a certain subset that will go out to the edge, go, ooh, cold. <laughs> oh, nice and warm in the middle. And you can really see this with individual animals within a, within a group, and that's across the board with, with social species. Even the geese that fly overhead at the moment, there are very lazy ones that go to the front, oh, a bit difficult, go to the back straight away. But it's only through social, pure social cooperation we can achieve a huge amount. And Jane realized this. And back in 1991, she set up a collaborative project where getting individuals together was going to be more beneficial, more useful, more uh, a better way to achieve. She set up a group of students in Tanzania. There were nine schools together, and there were 12 kids or young people working together. And they wanted to work on a multi-tiered project, including species, habitat, and people. It was called Roots and Shoots. Nice little project. 
25 years later, it's in over 100 countries. So I spoke with her last night, she's in China. There are 2,000 groups in China at the moment, and they're in lots of places you wouldn't expect. They're in North Korea, Iran, America. All these places that are really, really pushing the boundaries of a collaborative research and collaborative work. It's incredible. In the UK alone, there are over two million young people who've been through Roots and Shoots programs in the last 15, 20 years now. It really is incredible. And some of the stories there are amazing as well. These are all set up by young people like yourselves or younger. So I get lots of emails and calls saying, can we set up a, a Roots and Shoots project? One of them was from a guy in Nepal who um, set up this amazing project where every four years they have a ceremonial slaughter, mass slaughter of buffalo, bison, cattle. And they kill something like 4,000 animals in about three or four days and the streets are awash with blood. And this group of young people set up this project, this Roots and Shoots program, and worked with local people. They tried to change opinions. They realized that there was a, a clause in the, uh, the text that everyone was following that you had to kill something alive. Now they kill pumpkins. Sounds crazy, but people actually grow the pumpkins. They have to kill something alive. They sacrifice pumpkins. Sounds crazy. Saves a lot of money. Saves a lot of cleaning up streets. Uh, and the last time it happened, exponentially fewer animals were killed. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, there was a grove, a sacred grove that had been totally deforested. And a local group of kids set up there again, set up a, a Roots and Shoots program. I said, we want to replant these trees. Can someone come with us? And there were no real adults in the area who wanted to go with them. So this group of kids, and the eldest was 15, took a group of militia men, these guys armed with AK-47s, it's a massively, awfully war-torn country, to this sacred hill and started digging. These kids started digging to plant these trees. And the ground was so hard, they couldn't. And without any questioning or without any asking them to, one of the guys put his gun down and started digging with these kids. And there are some incredible photos and stories about this group of children who worked with these, these militia guys. I think that's an incredible opportunity to really tie in not only individuality, but through that and through really understanding yourself and the animals you're working with, the people around you, the people and, and things you share your life with, gives you an incredible opportunity. But the thing is, the nice thing is, you never know when it's gonna pop up, when that eureka moment will, will be there, that uh, moment of revelation that you can find yourself. With Jane, it was her dog, Rusty. When she was very young, Rusty taught her loads of stuff. With me, it was a few years ago, I was up in northwest Scotland, a little island off the coast, working with deer. Not the biggest fan of deer, I'm um, gonna say. It was an interesting project, it wasn't a chimp, so it was, it was all right. And my job was to chase the babies, tag the babies, do some really cool genetics testing, and make this amazing family tree and phylogeny of things we were doing up there. I went and tagged a baby deer one day, and did my job, took the ear tag, absolutely great, patted it down with moss so it wouldn't smell, so his mum wouldn't reject it. Had to go back next morning to find their baby deer, and the baby deer had been abandoned and died. And that was a huge moment for me. It was, I hadn't thought of the consequences of my actions. And I sat there and cried for about like two hours with this poor little deer in my, in my lap. And like any morbid biologist, I cut the ear tag off from its ear. So we used to put different ear tags, we knew the individuals. Cut the ear tag off and I take it everywhere with me now. Because that was my moment, that was my point that I realized as an individual, I really have to think about what I'm doing. I think that's the really important thing there. And we can all do something that makes a difference. It's very easy to say, I'm too young, or I'm not in a position of power, I can't make a difference yet, there's just one of me. But if one of you decides to do something, or change something, or not do something, then that's already halfway there. And then there's another person who'll agree, or who'll help, or who wants to do, do this. I walked in this morning. We've all got plastic bottles. We've all got throwaway cups. It takes one of you not to use a plastic bottle or a throwaway cup or to buy a recyclable um, cup for your coffee the next time you're in town. We're gonna do the pant hoot again. <laughs> Be warned. And this time I do want you to have a go. I want you just, just, I can't see you. No one's gonna see you. And if you're all doing it, you'll all sound as silly as each other. What I want you to do this time is really get into the mood of this and really think as an individual, I can hear my voice, but if a group of individuals work together, 
It can be incredible. Thank you.